Hello everyone, so today I want to talk about the great man versus small man theories on history. Now the great man theory basically says that, let's take a couple examples. Without Alexander the Great, history would not be the same. His willpower, his conquests, his intelligence are what set history on an entirely different course. Same with Caesar. Great man theory would say that without Caesar, history would have been set on an entirely different course. Somebody like him would not have existed. And basically, Western civilization as we know it would not take in the form that we have now, or world civilization. The great man theory focuses on very specific figures and their willpower and their uniqueness, and how if that uniqueness and willpower didn't exist in those individuals, then certain events in history would not have happened, changing the course of all of history, really. So, I would like to say off the bat that um, I'm more in favor of the small man theory. Now, I'm not really sure if it's called the small man theory, but I'm choosing to call it that for this video. I think that Alexander the Great and Caesar were, for instance, were products of their society and their environment, and that they were inevitable. Let me explain a little bit. So Alexander the Great, um, there was a lot of, you know, conscript, conscription in the Persian Empire. Uh, there wasn't a lot of commitment. Somebody was eventually bound to come in and take Darius down, Darius down. Um, and in Alexander the Great society, Macedonia, and also Greece, really, there was this, here's what you do when you become a king. You go and conquer. You go and avenge past insults. You go and expand your empire. And you go and you go be a warrior on the front lines. Now, even these few factors were bound to produce somebody like Alexander the Great. It might have taken a little longer. But the idea that somebody couldn't have figured out how to fight the Persians and expand Macedonia east without somebody that is very specifically Alexander the Great is not believable to me. King Philip, he very much shaped Alexander the Great. King Philip, he wanted to unify Greece and Macedon and have his rule be the number one rule. He wanted to not have a balance of power, but to have Macedon in the centralized um, focus of power. He didn't want it to be a hegemony, Greece. He didn't want it to be rivaling city-states. He wanted it to be an empire. And because of his actions, and because of his influence, his ideas being placed into Alexander the Great's head, um, Alexander the Great was, be, was able to become who he was. Now, Caesar. You don't have a Caesar without the terrible state that the Senate was in, the Roman Senate at the time, and just before and definitely during Caesar's you know, reign, or you know, during the Civil War, during his reign, and even before, his, before the Civil War. Um, the Senate was incredibly divided, incredibly partisan. Uh, we had the uh, Publians and the, Patri the Patricians. Now the Publians were supposed to represent the people patricians represent the nobility, the, um, the ancient families that started Rome or have been part of Rome for hundreds of years. And any little political uh, agreement, any little political, I guess you could say compromise, it was so dysfunctional and so backed by money in both parties and for every politician that Nobody wanted to concede anything because they didn't want to seem weak. They didn't want to lose even the slightest amount of power. And it really wasn't about Rome at that point. It wasn't. Um, I'll give you an example of why, why they were so hierarchical. Um, basically, everybody in the Senate, every man in Rome that had any nobility or definitely part of the government, they would literally rank the the um, the power of individuals from like one to a hundred. So everybody wanted to be the first man of Rome, the most powerful man in Rome. So you wanted to be number one. And every year they'd rank all 100 most power, powerful people in Rome. So it almost invites 
aggravation, conflict. And the public knew this. The public were, were tired of the partisanship. They were tired of people that were in charge that didn't give a crap about them. And they were just begging for somebody to come along and fight for them to be their leader instead of following these individual senators or being on the patrician or uh, publian side. They just really wanted somebody to come along and take the power out of the hands of something that was obviously so corrupt. So without that popularity, as far as uh, Caesar got for being a man of the people, giving back to the people, um, holding feasts where he gave people, uh, you know, he gave people a bunch of food. This is a popular tactic in ancient Rome. Hold a huge feast that lasts for a number of days and just give the populace free food. Without actions like that, without actions that lowered taxes uh, for everybody who was really feeling the burden of taxes, and without being more liberal in who's accepted into the Roman army, you don't have a Caesar. And a lot of this ha goes back to Marius. Uh, Marius, you know, he, he the, it's called the, Mar the Marius Reforms. He was somebody who basically said, look, we have to accept more, you know, of the population to our army. We can't just have our army consist of Roman landholders. It's, our army's not going to last like that. And the idea of a professional army, one that was always ready instead of just farmers that come and fight and then go back. And standardization of equipment, things like that. Now, without a Sulla, came later, still before Caesar, without a Sulla, uh, very much tried to do what Caesar did and become a dictator for life, but he was at the wrong time and he was too obvious in his methods and he didn't come to a Rome that was ready for change just yet for the amount of change that, change that Caesar brought. Without all these factors, you don't have a Caesar. Now, if Caesar didn't come along, Somebody else would have been a part of the triumvirate, which was Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus. Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus, they were like frenemies. <laughs> they didn't really like each other, but they understood that they could hold power together in this triumvirate. I truly think that Pompey and Crassus could have had another, a different member of, a, of their triumvirate, even if Caesar wasn't there. But regardless, you know, there's an idea that individual men because of their personal willpower, is what shapes the turning of history. But I don't think that's true. I think it's a bunch of factors and a bunch of people that make these factors and a bunch of situations at the time that these people took charge. So, you know, it's, it's a harder case to make that somebody like Alexander the Great would have came, came on eventually, but there are already a lot of military advancements in Macedonia, as far as formations go, as far as phalanx goes, in Macedonia and Greece that just needed to be headed by a strong leader in order to conquer the Persians because of their military tactics. Um, a lot of their soldiers, the Persian soldiers, used wicker shields. Uh, those would not stand up to, against a phalanx, especially a phalanx with bronze shields. Um, especially a phalanx, well, bronze shields for most Greek states at the time. But when Alexander the Great made the reform of extending spears, or uh, not lances, not spears, uh, their pikes to 18 feet, these pikes called a sarissa, to 18 feet, whereas Philip had extended it somewhat. But Alexander the Great says, okay, let's just make them 18 feet long, give our phalanx bucklers, rely on the cavalry as well as companion cavalry. Um, but we, we use the phalanx to stick an enemy in place and then we hit him with the cavalry from the sides. That was that was already a trend that was going to happen with Alex without Alexander. It would have happened. Um, however, Alexander the Great, his his pure willpower to push forward um, was kind of unique. Uh, I just think that it would have happened eventually. And here here's where we come upon a Western idea. This Western idea of okay, if you don't resist us, then we're not going to have a problem with you. We'll just, you know, we'll just kind of like go through your city or go through your territory and move on to the next enemy. But you have to become our allies. If you don't become our allies, then you're just asking for it. This is something that Caesar apparently got from Alexander the Great because he follows the exact same model. Alexander the Great, when he was doing the siege of Tyre 
it took longer than he wanted. It took over a month, I, I believe, if my if my uh, my dating is accurate. It took over a month, and he was just pissed off that he was held back so long. So and he killed a bunch of the citizens, uh, sold a lot into slavery, but crucified 10,000 of them just because, eh, you're not going to be my ally. Um, you're not going to let me go to the temple of Heracles in your city, which they weren't willing to do. They were okay with kind of being friendly with them, but they, didn't, they wouldn't allow him to go into the temple of Heracles because for some reason in Tyre, somebody like Alexander the Great would not be allowed in there. So that's kind of what started the siege because Alexander the Great wasn't allowed in, so that started the conflict. And he didn't, he didn't have to besiege Tyre. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do it because he wanted to have a secure rear. He didn't want his rear to be occupied by a hostile city. He wanted to control all the land that he was walking through, basically. And, and there's just no reason that he could have done it. And he justifies it just by saying, because he had very good um, historians with him. I, I forget what he calls them. But uh, people that were taking down everything that he did and everything that he thought, what, what he would say, uh, you know, with his permission. Um, he just says, yeah, well, they, they had it coming because I, I offered them, you know, an alliance. I offered to, you know, all you have to do is let me into the temple of Heracles and get, let, allow me to give offerings to Heracles and then become my ally and then I can go along. And then they didn't do it. So what, what could I do? <laughs> Which is such a Western imperial way of doing things. You know, it might've even started with Alexander the Great when it comes to Western civilization. Um, when it comes to Caesar, he very much was either you're with us or against us. Either you're with Rome, you're an ally of Rome, you provide us with grain and troops and free passage through your territory, or we're going to have to fight you and take it. And he would have done that to the entire world if he had enough men, supplies, and lifespan. Uh, but thank God Caesar didn't have those things, so he wasn't able to really conquer more of the world. Especially when going up against people like the Gauls, um, Helvetii, uh, the Germans, um, well, in Germania, they weren't called the Germans at the time, um, the Britons. Going up all against, against these tribal, tribal civilizations that did things like raise cattle, ate meat, drank milk, ate cheese, I assume, as well, even though it's, I haven't found a reference to cheese in this time period. Um, they found that barbaric. Like, no, we eat bread and, and that we make from wheat. That's how civilized people do it. Another thing is all these warriors and these tribes and these lands near him, they were all about personal honor. When it goes back, you know, the Druids and tribalism in general, it was all about honor, personal glory. It wasn't about the glory of their particular tribe or their particular land or, you know, if you can call it a nation, uh, their particular nation. It's, there's a bunch of warring tribes with any, every single, what we think of as a nation right now. Um, Gaul, Britannia, uh, Germania, um, the, uh, the Helvetians, which are Switzerland. Um, but it was, it was mainly about personal glory and the way that the Romans fought uh, and the reasons that they fought and their constant expansion was very foreign to these other tribes and these other peoples and these other lands. So, but Caesar once again propagated the idea that, eh, well, you asked for it if you're going to be our ally. Um, do I think that Caesar is different in the sense that other Romans didn't think that or would have done the things that he did? No. Caesar especially was a product of his environment, his society. So, you know, he sold hundreds of thousands of women and children into slavery and men. He, he raised cities, butchered populaces for providing any resistance. But he didn't have to go into Gaul. He didn't have to go into Germania. He didn't have to go into Britain. But he wanted to expand. He wanted to be great like Alexander the Great. And that's kind of where West, Western expansionism was born. Um, Caesar... So, you know, he was very much a product of his society and very much a product of the way that Rome was going, the direction it was going. He just happened to hop ahead of everybody else. Um, so, you know, he had such an effect, Caesar did, that for many centuries afterwards, not directly after, but later on, 
uh, there were czars in Russia, and czar comes from the word Caesar. And in, um, in Germany, you have Kaiser, which comes from the word Caesar. And in other uh, countries directly around them, um, Caesar left such an impact that they were using his name. Plus, you know, after Caesar died, all the uh, emperors afterwards would title themselves Caesar. So that, of course, <laughs> played into uh, making that name more prevalent. Do I think that it could have been another name by another person? Yes, I really do. Um, Caesar, one of his greatest downfalls, which is kind of goes against the great man theory for sure, is that he thought he was so great, he was so popular, he was so wonderful, that everybody in the Senate would be fine with him coming back and claiming absolute power for the rest of his life. So he didn't have any bodyguards, didn't have any weapons, and when he's alone with these senators that and telling him, you know, I'm in charge now, and here's what you got to do, he gets stabbed to death. And, you know, Shakespeare said, e tu brutu, or e tu brutus, I can't remember how you say it, in Latin, uh, which means, and you brutus, you know, my friend, my, uh, oh God, I think it was a son-in-law. Anyway, um, but that's more Shakespearean than actual history. That was just kind of something he added in. But he was so convinced of his own right to rule and his own his own uh, him convincing himself and convincing others for so long that he didn't think there was any danger and then he got killed for it alexander the great he thought his army was so powerful that when he went into india he thought he could conquer the whole nation the well not nation but the whole continent well not continent but the whole area of india but there's so many different kingdoms with millions of warriors that he had to realize that he has to turn back. You know, he says that it's because his troops convinced him that they're like, look, we can't go any further, please, let's turn back, which might have been part of it. But he kind of acts like, oh, I could have gone further and conquered more of India. No, he couldn't have. He couldn't have. That, that was the cap on Alexander the Great. Um, when it comes down to... When it comes down to if Caesar and Alexander the Great, were they good people? No. They were awful. Uh, killers for no reason, slavers for no reason. Um, and the argument that's brought up is, you know, in the future, people might say that about us. And you might be careful about how you judge people in the past because at the time, you know, s p people like Caesar, other Roman generals and other um, Greek generals and, and, and things like that, so when we're going back to Alexander the Great too, they would have done the same thing that Caesar and Alexander the Great did. They would have killed families, sold other families into slavery, tortured people. Like, yeah, they they did. That doesn't make that doesn't mean that just because that's the standard of the time that it's a good standard. It's a bad standard. And I welcome the future judging us. Because if the future is judging us and what we did as as being wrong, that means we're moving forward. So I welcome judgment from the future. We don't have to be careful about judging people in the past. People in the future should judge us for the things that we're doing now as far as when it comes to being compassionate, a good person. Because if they're judging us in the future, that means that they're at a place where they are in a position to do so. Which is wonderful. We should be judged. We shouldn't be emulated. We shouldn't be admired. We should be moved past. So, when it comes to the patterns of history... I'm going to try to wrap it up here <laughs> as much as I can because this video has gone on for a while. Um, so, during the Roman Empire, they went from, they went from multiple city-states. People came to this place we call Rome. Um, they hated kings, and they hated the Greek kings. They hated other kings they were, they were under, and they founded this city called Rome. So, they went from monarchy to a republic. They founded a republic. It took them hundreds and hundreds of years to get to empire. And then the empire, both the West slightly less than the East, lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. These empires with emperors. So we fast forward to the French Revolution, around the time of Napoleon. Also, Napoleon was very much a product of his time. Without the French Revolution, Napoleon wouldn't have been Napoleon. Um, without the Jacobin Revolution and all that. Um, at any rate, um, they went through that whole process from king to republic to empire within a matter of decades instead of hundreds of years. It repeated almost the same. They founded a republic, it started to get dysfunctional very quickly, and then the French people were just begging for an emperor like Napoleon to just claim himself as emperor instead of being a consul, which, you know, if they, 
had studied Roman history enough, they would have realized that um, unless you have a functional republic that has checks and balances, then it's going to go into empire very quickly because the people will be tired of that government. They want a singular leader to actually fix things instead of having all this combativeness, disagreement, selfishness. Um, and then it went back to monarchy soon after. They went through all the stages that Rome did, um, except for maybe the, the last part being a monarchy, though an emperor is almost the same as a monarch, basically. Um, and in a matter of decades, the United States, we have modeled ourselves off of Rome, and justly so. Um, but there's one caveat. We have put in those checks and balances to try to avoid Rome's fate, uh, to try to avoid the fates of, of the whole process of Rome's history, which was wise. Time will tell if it pays off, because right now, People are really, really tired of the Democrats and Republicans, like the Publians and the Patricians. Same old damn story again. Um, being so divided, being so lacking compromise, being so backed by money of, of singular individuals or corporations. We're seeing the same story again. And the checks and balances might hold our nation together. I hope it does. And I hope that, I don't think it will, but... The reason we have the president we do now, Trump, is because people are tired of the partisanship and the, and the politics and the swamp in Washington. What those people that voted for Trump don't realize is that, well, didn't at the time, was that he ain't draining the swamp. And thank God he's not smart enough to be somebody like a Caesar who could actually solidify the power that he has, that he had because of the approval of the people. He's just too stupid. And I think that after this hiccup, either we fall from here and we become more imperial with an emperor, we won't call it emperor, or we realize, wow, we screwed up. Uh, let's get money out of politics. Because when we get money out of politics, that's one of the major reasons Rome failed is because there was a lot of money in politics and few people actually had uh, influence in the government and the laws that they made. But anyway, I'm getting off track. The, uh, the great man theory, it's BS. People are a product of their environment and everybody stands on the shoulders of those who come before them and the influences that they have in, the, in their lives before they become anybody of note are instrumental. There would have been another Napoleon. There would have been another Caesar. There would have been another Alexander. It might have taken a little longer. But these people are not special and different from us. They just have to be, either be in the right place at the right time with... A lot of luck. At any rate, I hope this has been interesting. Way more history than I meant to put in it. But I hope that the great man theory versus small man theory, I hope you know my view on it. I believe in the small man theory, a lot of different factors. And uh, feel free to uh, shoot down in the comment section below if you disagree or agree. And I try to get to every comment. If you want to find me on Facebook and actually ask me questions one-on-one, -on -one, go to www.facebook.com slash hunter.salazar. Once again, www.facebook.com slash hunter.salazar. Thank you very much for watching and hope to see all of you on the channel in the future.